Good afternoon and welcome to today's installment of the 2022 January series. I'm Anastasia Watson, a junior from Grand Rapids, Michigan, studying politics, philosophy, and economics. I'm also a student employee for the DeVries Institute. Would you please take a moment to silence your cell phones? As you are doing so, I would like to welcome guests at all of our 50 simulcast viewing locations, including Sioux Center, Iowa, Litchfield Park, Arizona, and East Lansing, Michigan. And all our virtual attendees across time zones, we are grateful you are joining us today. And now, would you please join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Lord, thank you that we get to begin this new year gathered together to learn and grow in knowledge and understanding. Thank you for the opportunity to hear from Dr. Jones today. Please speak clearly through him and open our minds and hearts to his words. Thank you for calling us to an institution like Calvin University that equips us with what we need to further your kingdom here on earth. We love you, Lord, and in your son's name we pray, amen. And now, Noah Tolley, Calvin's provost, will introduce our guests. Good afternoon. My name is Noah Tolley, and I serve as provost here at Calvin University. Welcome. Since I started my work here this past summer, this is my very first January series, and I look forward to the rich lineup of speakers that will be joining us here this month. And it's my great honor today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Greg Jones. Like me, Dr. Jones is in a new job, having begun his work as president of Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee, this past June. In a time of deep social crisis, fracture, fragmentation, not to mention a challenging moment in higher education, Dr. Jones has begun his presidency with the theme, Let Hope Abound, and an emphasis on community and regional partnerships to promote the flourishing of Nashville, the Middle Tennessee region, and the entire state. In addition to his recent work leading Belmont, Dr. Jones has twice served as Dean of Duke Divinity School and has served as Provost and Executive Vice President of Baylor University. He has also served various foundations in advisory capacities and is currently on the boards of the John Templeton Foundation, the McDonald Agape Foundation, and the India Collective. And he is an ordained United Methodist pastor. He is the author of more than 200 essays or articles and 19 books on themes such as forgiveness, Christian leadership, and social innovation. His most recent book is Navigating the Future, Traditioned Innovation for Wilder Seas, which I personally have commended highly to anyone who will listen. I could go on and on about Greg's many talents and his work in cross-cultural context, but I am already testing my time limits. I will only add that Greg is a wonderful conversationalist the kind of person you feel like you've known for a long time, even if it's your first time connecting in person. And I'll confess today that I'm jealous of his metaphors. Every time I think I've landed on a good new one that will help us to better understand the situation of higher education, for example, I realize that Greg has already used that same metaphor to even greater effect. I learned a few new ones from him last night, and I guess he has at least one up his sleeve for us today. In either way, you're in for a treat. I want to remind the audience that afterward, Dr. Jones will be available in the West Lobby to meet with audience members who would like to chat with him. Before we get started, I want to thank our sponsors again. Calvin University is grateful to the Howard Miller Company and the DeVries Institute for Global Faculty Development for underwriting today's presentation. And now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Greg Jones to the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Noah, for that very kind introduction. It's a great joy to be back at Calvin uh, University, a place I have visited many times, and it's always a joy to be here. Not always as great a joy in January as it is in June or July, but uh, it's nonetheless a great joy to be with you here at 
Calvin. I want to begin by drawing your attention back to what is probably your favorite book of the Bible, uh, the one that uh, shapes most Bible studies on a regular basis called the book of Numbers. Not many people look at it because most of us, when we see the title, it gives us some kind of PTSD for that moment in our life when we decided math was no longer for us. In the Jewish tradition, the book is often called the, In the Wilderness. If that was the title of the book, then it really would be a topic for Bible studies because it marks so much of our current realities, that sense of being in the wilderness. At the heart of the first part of the book, there's a series of stories that culminate at the heart in Numbers 13 and 14 when Moses sends out 12 spies sends them out to spy out the promised land. They come back, they're the first Americans in the Bible because they have a majority report and a minority report. The majority report, 10 of the spies say we can't go forward. Yes, it's a land flowing with milk and honey, but there are creatures up ahead. They look like giants and we look like grasshoppers. We'd better go back to Egypt. Only two of the 12 spies, Joshua and Caleb, say it's a land flowing with milk and honey, and if God is calling us there, we can trust God to lead us there. Well, you know the story. They put the vote to the Israelites, and the Israelites say, let's go back to Egypt. Egypt was suffering and slavery and oppression, but Egypt was familiar. My father used to say that every church he ever served or was a part of had a Back to Egypt committee in it. (laughs) The truth of the matter is every one of us has a Back to Egypt part of our souls. When we sense where God is calling us and, and what the future looks like, we get scared and we wonder about going back to Egypt. It's a loss of a sense of purpose, a loss of a sense of mission. And I thought that was the heart of the story until I read a book by Aviva Zornberg, a Jewish scholar. The title of her book is Bewilderments. And as she's reflecting on this particular story of the 12 spies, she says, when the 12 spies and the the Israelites decide that they want to go back to Egypt, she says, they suffered a fate worse than physical death. It was the death of their imagination. Fate worse than physical death, the death of their imagination. My friends, I think we're living in a time, particularly in American culture and more broadly in the world, where we're suffering from an imagination deficit disorder, where because of the multiple pandemics that we're dealing with, it's COVID to be sure, but it's not only COVID. It's also the heightened attention to racial injustice, the economic disruptions, the political polarization and fracturing that Noah mentioned in his introduction, the mental health challenges we're dealing with. We're all reeling and on our heels, and we're suffering from an imagination deficit disorder that threatens us with something worse than physical death, the actual death of our imagination. We're finding ourselves Amidst these multiple pandemics, afflicted by crises on multiple fronts, we've lost trust with one another and trust in institutions. That that rise of distrust is intensifying and increasing our pandemic issues. And at heart, the crisis of institutions is magnifying all of the other dimensions of our issues. We don't trust our healthcare institutions. We don't trust our educational institutions. Increasingly, our religious institutions are divided and divisive across the board. We're struggling. The crisis of institutions isn't only of the last two years. It's not only been caused by the pandemic. It's been building for many decades partly because institutions have failed and betrayed us. They haven't kept up with what they needed to be doing, and so there are performance-based distrust of institutions across the board. The difficulty is that in recent decades, that performance-based distrust of when an institution fails, most celebratedly 
for example, Enron or WorldCom or whatever big organization has a major crisis, it's now collapsed into what Hugh Hecklow calls a culture-based distrust of institutions. Where it's not just when they fail us that we're distrustful, it's also when they're doing okay. We've become distrustful and cynical and distanced ourselves. In the midst of the pandemic, that cynicism and that distrust is manifesting itself in what's being called the great resignation, where people are opting out of jobs and organizations and even volunteer work to resign from any kind of commitment or engagement and a desire simply to go it alone. The distrust of institutions is also becoming increasingly magnified by a distrust interpersonally, and those two things are interrelated. We're becoming more and more cynical about our relationships as well as our institutions. Interestingly, a recent study showed that the number of square footage a person has for their living arrangements has been increasing at a very rapid pace, at the same time that the number of friends that people say they could call on in a crisis has been diminishing rapidly. It's as if we're swapping square footage for trusting relationships. And part of that is those interpersonal dimensions of trust are bound up with institutional health. We can't have one without the other. You see, the performance-based distrust that connected itself to that culture-based distrust of institutions has led us to become really naive about what sustains human life. We think the solution somehow to bad institutions is no institutions, as if we could live without them, when the only solution to bad institutions is to cultivate healthy institutions. You see, what we need is a trusting environment for institutions that also cultivate those environments in which interpersonal trust can develop and deepen and extend. Even our families are becoming more and more beset by crises, whether it's because of political fracture or other kinds of divides. We're losing the fabric that makes our life possible. You see, institutions, when they're healthy, are like offensive linemen in football. We only notice them if they screw up. Healthy institutions become the backdrop of what makes our life possible. And what we're feeling now, the kind of being on our heels, the kind of disruption, the kind of decay, the kind of frustration, the kind of despair, discouragement that's leading to the great resignation is because yellow flags are being dropped all around the field saying, this institution isn't working, that institution can't be trusted, this institution is failing, and we're finding ourselves exhausted because we can't take them for granted in a positive way. For a couple of years, I suffered with a disease called migraine-associated vertigo. It's more a description than a diagnosis, but I suffered from a combination of migraines and vertigo simultaneously, and there were times when it took all the strength and energy I had to try to stand up because of all of the disorientation. And then I realized how, when I'm healthy, I can be standing and walking and doing all sorts of things without being conscious of it. I can focus my attention on important things. Whereas when I was suffering vertigo, all my energy was spent just trying to figure out if it was okay to stand up. When we're distrustful and cynical about institutions, when our institutions are imploding and weakening and falling apart, it's as if we're suffering moral and cultural and political and spiritual vertigo where all our energy is just spent trying to figure out why things are falling apart. Ask any quarterback if he cares about having a really good offensive line. You want them functioning well so you don't pay attention to them. No offensive lineman wants their number called over the loudspeaker because that's a bad sign. And institutions these days are beset with that same kind of problem. problem. 
You see, healthy institutions are the fabric that makes human life possible. Sometimes we've become cynical thinking that maybe institutions are just a result of the fall. But even Luther, who is most known for just thinking about ordering of human life as a consequence of the fall, in his lectures on Genesis said, even if Adam and Eve had never sinned, the law and institutions would still have been given. Because we depend on habits, and we depend on structures and organizations that make our life possible and flourish, that we can take for granted in the good sense and then continue to nourish them. And so institutions we can trust and believe in matter enormously to our life together. They're part of the fabric of who we are. There are a variety of reasons why we've allowed institutions to become problematic. It includes the fact that even our metaphors for them have become problematic. We now think of institutions and organizations in mechanistic terms with things like organization charts as if they are static. John Gardner pointed out in a book 50 years ago called Self-Renewal that we shouldn't have mechanistic metaphors. We need organic metaphors because organizations and institutions are always growing and decaying and needing to be pruned. Gardner was actually evoking a biblical set of metaphors around that sense of organic institutions and what it means to grow and decay. You see, if institutions are inert and a mechanistic metaphor works, then we'll argue about whether change is necessary. And you know what? If the choice is, do we have to change? Most people will say no. Machiavelli put it that way 500 years ago in, in The Prince when he said, men like new ideas only when they have long experience of them. So if the choice is a new, something new or what's familiar, we'll always choose what's familiar. We'll even go back to Egypt because it's familiar. But if we have organic metaphors for our organizations and we recognize that we're always needing to prune and to grow and to see the opportunities for that development. Then we'll discover what it means to invest and care for those institutions. And guess what? It's not only dependent on the president or CEO or on the C-suite leaders. It's not only dependent on those who are officially employed. It's dependent on all of us to care for and attend institutions in the same way that we're called to care and tend gardens and ecosystems. Imagine my astonishment in reading a book by a U.S. Army General, Stanley McChrystal, and his fundamental metaphor for leadership in the military is a gardener. If you're a gardener, you learned you don't get the fruit or the vegetables unless you're attending all of the dynamics of that environment day by day, week by week, paying attention to the weeds and the soil and what is needed to be fertilized, and the rain, all of the dynamics that make something eventually flourish. Some things are growing and other things are decaying. My sister avoided my family business of ministry by going into wildlife biology, and I learned from listening to her about ecosystems, about how important it is to allow some things to die because that allows other things to live. That fallen trees will be where birds will find their nests and beavers will find their wood to make their dams, and all of those dynamics. And so we need healthy metaphors for our institutions that require our attention and our trust if we're to enable them to flourish. Yuval Levine published a book at a very awkward time. I feel bad for him, it came out in February of 2020 just getting ready to do a book tour to launch the book, and the pandemic hits. It's nonetheless an important, if not very well-known book called A Time to Build. And his point is that we in America need to be about building institutions, new ones, renovating existing ones, paying attention to the overall ecosystem of institutions if we're to enable life to flourish. Now, he works and lives in Washington, so he's paying a particular attention to all the dynamics of government and what that makes possible. But his point is much broader. And here's what he says. 50 years ago, we stopped paying attention 
to the health of our institutions. And he said, so they're decaying across the board. And then he says this, he says, insofar as we pay attention to institutions at all, insofar as we pay in attention to institutions at all, we've turned them into platforms for celebrity when healthy institutions are molds of character. Healthy institutions, whether education, business, health, religion, churches, whatever organization you think of, when they're functioning well, they help to shape our character. They cultivate virtues. They set guardrails for our behavior, the ways we interact with one another. That's what healthy families as an institution do, is to nurture us and shape our character. What Levine is saying is most of the time we don't pay attention to institutions at all. And when we do, we've turned them into platforms for celebrity rather than molds of character. His diagnosis is profound. Unfortunately, his prognosis isn't nearly as encouraging, except to say we need it. And this is where I want to take us back on a history lesson to suggest that people of faith, specifically Christians, can lead the way in renewing a commitment to trusting institutions. It's by rediscovering the power of Christianity's surprise in the early church. That image of Christianity's surprise is the title of a book by my friend and colleague Kevin Rowe. His presenting question is, how did Christianity go from 5,000 followers of Jesus in the year 50 to 5 million followers two centuries later? As he looked at that question, he said, well, there were two core convictions. One was the resurrection of Jesus had inspired a sense of Easter hope, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost had provided a sense of Pentecostal power. And that combination of Easter hope and Pentecostal power unleashed a movement that was extraordinary. It was rooted in a story that begins at Genesis 1 and ends at Revelation 22. It's a story where the center point, the pivot of the plot, is the resurrection of Jesus and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But it becomes a comprehensive story of hope and new life, where Christ is the true human. Yes, we're sinful creatures, and we can do all sorts of stuff left to our own devices. And yet, inspired by Easter and empowered by Pentecost, we're also capable of transformed new life, new community. Discovering what 1 Timothy 6 calls the life that really is life. And those early Christians, empowered by that sense of Easter and Pentecost, started going throughout the Greco-Roman world to offer that new life. And guess what they did? They started all kinds of institutions. Institutions to care for orphans. Institutions to care for the poor. Institutions to care for widows and those who were sick. The first hospitals in the history of the world were founded by Christians because Jesus told them to care for the sick. And they recognized that healthy institutions are necessary. They created so many institutions that Julian the Apostate, the Roman emperor in the fourth century, said, these nasty Galileans, by which he meant Christians, he said, these nasty Galileans, they're making us look bad. We've got to do what they're doing. Because otherwise, people are going to join up with them. <coughs> well, the problem was, for him, it was just a technique. It was something that began to look like bureaucracy. Rather than something that was inspired and empowered by a sense of purpose, by a sense of transcendence, by a sense of the inbreaking of God, the reign of God. And so the early Christians continued to inspire and empower new businesses, new innovation, because of that conviction that God was at work and they were called to care for widows, orphans, and the poor, to embrace all those as children of God, and to create and sustain and renew institutions. And that's been the story for much of the history of Christianity. Christianity was surprising to people because it was creating institutions that made life abundant, made it more sustainable. 
made it more transformative. In the Middle Ages, it was often through monasteries that would offer care for children and others, the institutions of hospitality. And Christians were at the forefront of innovation, of meeting human needs and helping people discover life abundant and cultivating that sense of trust that became the source and the incubator of life. You see, in the early church, that, Chris, that surprising character of Christianity was a place where institutions became laboratories of learning and incubators of leadership, sources of new life and opportunity. And that's what enabled Christianity to spread so powerfully across the Greco-Roman world. In our day, we have so many established institutions that are decaying and struggling for survival because we've allowed them as Christians to mimic the broader world rather than to be a light that shines and makes other institutions look pale by comparison. I was talking to some leaders in the Church of England over in England, and I said, what would it take for you to have Christianity be surprising again? One bishop raised his hand. He said, I got churches in my diocese that go back to 765. And then another one said, well, I got one that goes back to 453. I thought we were going to do, name that tune, how do you got it down to the earliest church founded. And they said, nothing's going to be surprising when we've been around that long. My simple question was, is the Holy Spirit active anywhere in England? Because you see, it was in the early church a belief that the Holy Spirit was animating these institutions and giving them new life, helping retrieve in a spirit of what I call traditioned innovation, a retrieval of the best of the past to make new life possible, to cultivate those relationships of trust. It's at the heart of the story of Jesus on Good Friday and Easter that we are forgiven and set free for new life, and so we can retrieve the best of the past for the sake of new and life-giving future. We can cultivate relationships of trust. We can embody institutions of care like hospitals and clinics that bring people together, that help people discover the prospect of new life. We can be about the work of trusting one another and institutions. But it'll require that we become focused again on God. That we have to recognize that at the heart of what healthy institutions and healthy living is about is a sense to being called out of ourselves and beyond ourselves into new possibilities. Too often our institutions today are rife with conflict of a destructive sort. All institutions, any relationship has good conflict in it. I have three kids and I used to joke that when the five of us were on a trip and we were talking about where to stop for dinner, there were always at least seven different opinions. But that was good conflict about where we would go. What Amanda Ripley in a new book called High Conflict distinguishes is healthy and good conflict from what she calls high conflict, where all you care about is that the other lose. And too often that's now marking the fights and the divisions within and across institutions. We're tearing them down rather than engaging in the kind of appropriate conflict that can help us navigate the future faithfully and well. The kind of ongoing debates about what's the best parts of our past that we want to retrieve to enable us to have the most life-giving parts of our future that we can discover. And that's an ongoing disagreement, a cultivated, meaningful disagreement that can help us trust one another and trust our institutions. But you see, we're so used now to destructive conflict that we're afraid to nurture meaningful disagreements. I know in the January series you'll have other speakers, I think tomorrow even, that are talking about those meaningful disagreements, and that's what we're desperate for, but we won't be able to have them unless we're also paying attention and caring for the institutions that can nurture and care for us all. The early Christians were surprising because they were called out of themselves to take risks, to develop trust to live into new life as agents of hope everywhere they went. 
and they surprised people, and the movement grew. The best solution to problematic institutions isn't to pretend we can exist without them. It's to lean into the creation and the renewal of institutions to make them healthy, to make them life-giving, to have healthy and good conflict that can navigate the future well. That's what we need in our institutions. And it's about rediscovering Christianity's surprise. What would it take for Christianity to be surprising in higher education or in healthcare in the United States? We were at the forefront of so much of social innovation, founding K-12 and higher education institutions, founding health clinics and hospitals, many of which we've just let drift and disappear until they are barely distinguishable, if at all, from secular alternatives. We need to be about cultivating and renewing and starting new institutions to bear witness to the inbreaking reign of God. We can't afford to go back to Egypt. We need to be trusting and focused on the future. Well, I think there are five lessons that we can learn from, from Christianity's surprise in the early centuries that can help us rediscover that and cultivate trusting institutions. The five lessons spell an acronym called PATCH. The P is purpose. Rediscovering the purpose of institutions to bear witness to transcendence, to God's reign. Simon Sinek has a book called The Infinite Game. He said, healthy organizations and institutions don't play a finite game where they're thinking about wins and losses or rankings or things like that. They're focused on an infinite game that lasts generations. His analysis cries out for a discussion of the reign of God because that's the infinite game we're called to be about. It's about having a clear sense of purpose and that sense of transcendence that can orient us. That's what impelled Christianity's surprise and enabled institutions to be trusted, not because institutions never fail. Institutions like human beings are part of this world. And we'll fail and institutions will fail. But that's why we have forgiveness and we have to cultivate that kind of spirit. So it's about purpose and rediscovering that purpose and that focus on the future. The A is for anthropology, developing a robust sense of what human nature is like. You see, sometimes we create institutions that are overly romanticized, that human beings will never do anything wrong. We think of institutions as in our ideal as if they're Lake Wobegon where all the men are men and the women are above, uh, the women are women and the children are above average. We need a robust understanding of institutions that embrace what Christians know about human nature, that we're both sinners and saints. We're both fallen and forgiven. That we can do bad things, and that's why we need laws and rules and guardrails to guard against us. And we're capable of extraordinary service and outreach and love and faith and hope. So we need a robust anthropology, an understanding of the complexity of what human beings are like. Amanda Ripley in the book High Conflict says, we need to create institutions and societies that drive toward unity rather than toward adversarialism. And I thought, yes, but your image that human beings can just become united without recognizing the implications of human sinfulness is naive. We've got to have a recognition of the fullness of that and cultivate institutions that both acknowledge our brokenness and cultivate reconciliation and healing and hope. The T that we need, the lesson, is that trust requires risk. It's so much easier to break trust than it is to rebuild it. And yet the only way we can actually rebuild trust in interpersonal relationships or in institutions is if we're willing to take risks. And those risks are scary. Most of the time, we're hesitant even to change the clothes we wear or the way we wear our hair. And yet we're being asked to undertake a much greater risk to trust each other, to trust institutions, and to help rebuild the social fabric, to reweave it 
so that it's much stronger. Trust is going to require and entail risk. The C is that we've got to re re-emphasize character that entails institutionalized habits. There's no way you can develop the virtues of character apart from healthy institutions and the nurturing of habits. The strongest institutions we still have are in athletics and the military, and that's where the best virtues are being cultivated, although they're under threat themselves in all sorts of ways. But if we want character, we're going to need institutionalized habits. A friend of mine in Wisconsin likes to quote Teddy Roosevelt that a leader without character is a menace to society. And friends, we've got way too many leaders lacking character across all of our sectors, and it's tearing us apart. The fifth lesson is that hope entails agency. If we believe God raised Jesus from the dead and so we are people of Easter hope, that ought to propel us into action. It'd be too easy and a yearning for all of us to just say, oh, if somebody else, if we could just elect a president, if we could just find a mayor, if we could just find a CEO or a president, whatever it takes, if we could just get that person over there, they'll fix it. There is no they out there. Think of 2 Corinthians 5 when Paul says the ministry of reconciliation has been entrusted to, I always wanted to say the pope or a bishop or a pastor or somebody, and it just says us. That's you and me. If we're to let hope abound, if we're to embody hope, it's going to require our agency. So it's about purpose. It's about a... a an anthropology that understands the complexity of human nature. It's about a trust that entails risk. It's about character embodied in institutional habits. And it's about hope embodied in agency. If we can learn those lessons from the early church, from Christianity's surprise, we'll discover a renewed commitment to the importance of institutions. And we'll discover what it means to trust those institutions and for those institutions to be trustworthy and enable us to also develop better habits of trusting each other interpersonally and socially. That level of trust doesn't mean that we're always just being nice or that we're always agreeing. Some of my most trusted friends are people I disagree with about all sorts of things, and that's part of why I love and trust them. And I know I can count on them day in and day out. I'd much rather be measured by how many friends I know I can call in a time of crisis than how many square feet I have for my living arrangements. We depend and long for trusted and trusting institutions and relationships. It's not only the early church. There are examples around that we need to lean into and draw on of people who are helping to nurture that. One of the sources of inspiration for me is Father Greg Boyle out in South Central LA because he's developed an institution called Homeboy Industries that's trying to reestablish trust among some of those who are most characterized by distrust, namely gang kids. They literally are killing each other. Most of the time, we're just doing it metaphorically, but they were doing it literally. And so he wanted to find ways to get them out of those habits and into new life. And so he started Homeboy Industries. Started first a bakery, then a t-shirt company. And then he started Homeboy Plumbing. Didn't work out so well. Turns out not many people want gang kids coming into their homes with metal pipes. But over the course of time, he has brought lots of kids out of a distrustful, cynical, violent environment and helped them discover new life through homeboy industries. It's in educational institutions, sometimes in the inner city, sometimes in rural areas that inspire hope and that sense of agency and are focused on character and are involved in building trust. It's in health clinics. It's in new businesses that are creating jobs and opportunities for people. It's about investing in one another and in relationships. It depends on thinking of institutions of things as an ecosystem that needs tending by you 
and by me, by all of us together. And Christians ought to be leading the way. It ought to be people of faith who have that sense of transcendence, who recognize we don't need to go back to Egypt, who recognize that we can go forward in life-giving ways. I began by talking about the imagination deficit disorder, the risk of the death of the imagination being worse than physical death. We need to be cultivating an imagination that points to a life-giving future of an ecosystem of healthy institutions that you and I are committed to and devoting all of our resources, our time, our energy, our dollars, our best ideas to help to nurture that sense of life that really is life. You see, the alternative is pretty bleak. And there are days in the midst of multiple pandemics when I feel discouraged and wonder if there's gonna be a path forward. We're seeing the mental health crisis of increasing numbers of people who don't believe that there's a future that can be trusted. Friends, we know that there is a future that can be trusted because it's God who holds the future. And what we're called to do is to create the environments that nurture and enable a sustenance of hope, even amidst suffering. Even amidst change and turmoil, even amidst division and fracture, we can bear witness to the ways in which God is reweaving the social fabric in and through us by trusting institutions. I suggest that we lead the way, beginning today, in changing the narrative away from fracture and division and the great resignation by instead deciding collectively that we're gonna be part of the great renewal of commitment. A commitment to the vibrancy and the vitality of institutions and relationships of trust. Yes, it'll involve risk. Yes, it'll involve new habits. Yes, it'll involve our agency. But we can't afford any more of the great resignation. Let's join together in a great renewal of commitment and bear witness to the imagination that we see in Easter and in Pentecost and the story of a God who loves us so much that he sent his only son that we might discover life that really is life. Thanks very much. Karen Salpi, uh, you can send questions if you like to askjseries at calvin.edu or tweet them to hashtag askjseries. I'll start with uh, a personal question from a member of the audience who writes, I am a single retired person, not part of any church or organization. I have no voice, no power. What can people like me do besides volunteering or giving money? Hmm. Well, I'd say find some organizations to be invested in, um, not just with money, although that certainly is a good thing as well, and with time as volunteers or in, in other ways. But uh, I believe that uh, you know we are um, we're living in a time when uh, you know Robert Putnam's famous uh, analogy of bowling alone um, is is if anything intensified, and I think what we need is to find communities. And it doesn't have to be big organizations, smaller organizations that you nurture, but it requires a commitment mm -hmm. where you're going to, you know, it's a supper club that says, we're going to get together every Thursday night and we're going to argue. Because as Putnam notes, you know, if you're in a bowling league, you're going to argue about uh, uh, politics and life and, you know, what's going on with the sanitation issues in your neighborhood. You're going to have all that, but you're going to have to come back next week and be accountable for what you said one week. So, you know, the problem with social media is you can spout off and there's no accountability. Mm -hmm. If you're part of a small group or a community, there's accountability. And so, you know, I'll say something and then somebody comes back to me next week and says, hey, how about that? You know, whether it's a prediction of a football game or uh, a discussion of, you know, what the world's going to be like. And we need those sorts of relationships. And, you know, I'd say to any person is uh, cultivate unlikely friendships and uh, institutionalize them. Find Indeed. ways to create 
relationships that last. I have the sense that those relationships need to be built first um, on, well, you talk about uh, the, the church as an institution having the common, the shared value of an understanding of Easter hope and Pentecostal power. Um, maybe the bowling league has to, has to agree on reasons to be friends before they start to fight. Um, yeah, well, so I, that I do think that if you, if you yeah. cultivate relationships across time, you're gonna, find, you're gonna want to find you know, um, what uh, sociologists would call contact theory, yeah. kind of contact points, mm -hmm. you know, when, you know, too often we, we start by shouting at each other rather than saying, you know, are there things we share in common? Um, there was just on 60 Minutes a story about uh, uh, the guy who started StoryCorps has now started something called, uh, I think it's called Small Steps or One Small Step. And he's getting people who, who disagree with each other on all sorts of things to talk with each other on camera. Nice. But it, they start by finding things in common. And we've lost that ability right. to listen to one another and to, to find points of contact and connection before we find reasons to disagree. And you're right, social media can be toxic that way, but I think too about people who leave a church or leave an organization because they disagree without, without staying to, to, to duke it out, really, uh, or to come to terms. Yeah, no, I think that's, uh, that's part of the pathos of churches is they're becoming lifestyle enclaves rather than places of meaningful disagreements. Right, and, and that consumer mentality of the let, let the church serve me. Yeah. Uh, on the opposite side of the spectrum of the first question, a student writes, I often have a hard time saying no to commitments. How can we balance <laughs> engagement with institutions with caring for ourselves? Oh, it's a great, <laughs> great question. Um, well, I think that... Uh, you know, it's, somebody said to me recently, because I have the same problem the student has, that uh, my mom used to say it was a good thing I was not born a girl because I can't say no. <laughs> and I say yes to everything. Um, and uh, so I thought, you know, these are, um, these are important things. But somebody said to me, you know, before you say yes to anything, think about what the longer term implications of it are. Because I'll say, yes, oh, I'll come to this organizing meeting, not realizing that then that means I'm going to be put on a steering committee and I'm going to be asked to do. And, and so to think through, and what we really need is to become committed to fewer things deeply than to say yes to lots of things casually. Yes. Um, you know, I, I, I'm always mindful that Aristotle uh, in his Nicomachean Ethics said, if at the end of a life a person can count three to five people as friends, he will have been fortunate. And, you know, now you, you count friends by your Facebook connections. And, you know, most of those people, when I, I, I don't even remember if I've ever met a lot of those people. <laughs> and, and so that's where the metaphor that I used in, in the talk by saying, you know, friends you can call on in a time of crisis, that means you've spent enough time with them that they know you, you know them, and there's a bond that, you know, when a, when a deep friend um, asks you, uh, can you do this? Your first thought is not how much is it going to cost or what kind of time it'll take. Your first thought is, of course. Right. And we need those deep bonds. And so I'd say as hard as it is to sometimes say no, it's, 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 you don't say no, you say not now or not yet. And, and acknowledge the commitments that are going to entail um, both your time and your emotional and uh, mental energy. You know, that I knew when I left Duke to go to Belmont that it meant that I was going to fall in love with a new institution that was going to occupy a lot of my mental energy and my time. And that means I can't do things that I used to do because I've now made a new commitment. And there's, you know, a finite number of those. So figure out what, where you think the difference can really be made rather than just kind of saying yes here, yes there, and then you find out that you're living a life that doesn't add up to anything And you're letting everyone significant. down. Significant, yeah. 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 Okay, here's an easier one, not. <laughs> a, a couple people have written about this. African Americans have reason not to trust institutions that white America is invested in. How do we take those two perspectives together in rebuilding? And a related question ab about how do we, how do we cultivate the ability to tolerate differing viewpoints within an institution? Uh, well, um, both of those are really important. They're related they're also, and they're also distinct. The first thing I would say is yes, uh, African-Americans especially, but also Latinos, others, have reasons for uh, 
um, distrust. The key is not to become cynical. Find new possibilities uh, to develop um, those institutions. So, you know, Richard Allen, the founder of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, was kicked out of the Methodist Church in Philadelphia, and he found a new institution that in many ways looked like the white racist institution that he, um, that he left. Uh, one of the interesting questions, though, that uh, as I've talked to African Methodist Episcopal bishops is they created an institution that was too often defined by what it was against rather than what it was for. Yes. And so how do you keep focused on the future rather than the past? And I think this is one of the crucial issues around HBCUs, for example. African Americans learn to trust those institutions. How do they evolve in a new day and provide opportunities that are going to help equip leaders for the future? And those are, those are complicated dynamics. They involve... Um, hopefully new relationships. For example, at Belmont in Nashville, uh, I'm working with Fisk, a historically black college, and with Meharry Medical College, historically black medical school. How can we partner to create a, a more, more vibrant future? Do those folks have some distrust of me and of Belmont as a predominantly white institution? Absolutely. That's why I said trust involves risk. It involves risk on their side. It involves risk on our side. And it involves a willingness to recognize those complexities and make sure we build trust, which means sometimes you have to move slower. Mm -hmm. Because when you're trying to rebuild trust, uh, you have to pay attention to um, the fact that, that both, both sides may be wary and those who've suffered more at the expense may be more wary or, or likely are much more wary. The risk, though, is necessary. And sometimes we want, we want to find new life without risk. It just doesn't happen. Uh, a provost who will not be named here writes, uh, <laughs> institutional leaders are already heavily invested in institutions and their health, unless they're vicious. Uh, but what can they do to increase investment and trust in institutions by their broader stakeholders and constituencies? What virtues do these leaders need and what advice do you have for them? Mm -hmm. In 25 words or less. Yeah. I spend every day worrying that I'm not framing that right. Um, well, I think that uh, one of the most important things is to learn how to tell stories about what has made the institution that you're a part of um, lively at its best. Um, you know, when I got to Belmont, I read every history I could find to, to, uh, to understand what had enabled it to, to thrive. And it uh, goes back to two women from Philadelphia uh, in 1890. Who would have thought two women would start a, a college in the late 19th century. It's just counterintuitive. And yet, you begin to enter into their imagination, their hope, their desire for a brighter future to equip. In those days, young women is how Belmont started. Uh, turns out, I learned my grandmother uh, went toward Belmont, uh, the predecessor institution, in 1922 and 23. So then I start to imagine, oh, what was life like for her? So, you know, if you're at, at, at Calvin, what is it that's enabled Calvin to thrive? And how do we tell the stories of that? Now, there are things that have also held it back. And there have been problems and brokenness. And that's where the robust anthropology that says, oh, yeah, we sin as well as discover new life. And, and that. so the virtues, I think, um, have to do with love and have to do with hope, um, have to do with truthfulness, and I would say courage and perseverance. Because it is, um, it is a long slow obedience. You know, Eugene Peterson's phrase, a long obedience in the same direction. If the, if the institution has a clear north star, then there will always be a way to keep it centered. And you need to tell stories how to do that. And you've got to practice uh, the virtues. Oh, I forgot. The one, inst the one virtue for leaders that is absolutely essential is humility. Which is, you know, from a faith perspective, remembering that God is God and you're not. And if you have that perspective, um, you're going to both recognize that you might get it wrong and you need other people to help you uh, think it through, and also that um, you're, you're a uh, steward of an institution for a period of time. One of my favorite stories was uh, George Bush, H.W. Bush, was giving the commencement address at Duke, and um, he was former president at the time. Uh, and... Uh, one of my faculty colleagues came running up to him and like a kind of schoolgirl, just got all a flutter and shook his hand. It's, oh, it's so nice to meet such an important person. 
And uh, former President Bush was very gracious as he shook her hand. And he said, thank you, ma'am, but let me be clear about one thing. I'm an ordinary person who happened to hold an important office for a period of time. And I thought, oh, that's spot on. You know, I ask people to call me Greg because if they call me President Jones, they're going to have an overly inflated view of my ideas. I said, you know, out of every hundred ideas I have, only about three or four are worth following up on. <laughs> and if you think, oh, President Jones said, then those other 95 are going to cause problems. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's also a way of reminding me, I'm an ordinary person who happens to hold an important office for a period of time. And that humility should keep us grounded that we're stewards and we need to be focused on what's going to preserve this place 20 years from now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now. Uh, the question, should Christians engage more in Christian institutions or join in secular institutions with similar positive goals? Yes. <laughs> I like that. It's a both and. I think that uh, we need both. And I worry that, um, you know, I love Dietrich Bonhoeffer's image of the uh, seminary at Finkenwalde where he said it's a place for the deepest concentration inward for life in the world. Mm -hmm. We need strong Christian institutions for formation. I think Christian higher education is absolutely essential and can be a leader and a light in the midst of a lot of the chaos of higher education. And we ought to be preparing our students and others to live not only in Christian institutions, but to be leaven in secular institutions. And uh, I think there's huge opportunities there. I, you talked a little with students this morning about the danger of cynicism. And uh, a student writes, how, as Christians, how can we effectively respond to conspiracy theories? Oh. Um, I wonder if in the three remaining minutes you can uh, clear that up for us, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that one of the most important things we can do is, um, A, remain committed to truth with a capital T. And if we have that virtue of humility, we'll also recognize I don't have a monopoly on it. Um, and... Uh, Try to be sure that we have enough unlikely friends, both physical people we interact with and friends in terms of sources of information and news that we uh, acquire. Um, you know, I, my, I read, uh, I try to go online and read a number of different things every day, largely to disrupt my assumptions. And, and then I, I both understand, but I, I have friends who are prone to conspiracy theories both on the left and the right. And, you know, I'm always kind of going, whoa. But then I also think, well, what if there's something to what they're saying? You know, and so it's a, it's a means of kind of keeping a lively engagement, not being afraid, having the courage to say, I, I'm not so sure. And, and allowing someone else to have the courage to say, and you're crazy too. <laughs> um, and I, I worry a lot that we live in story loops you know, people only consume things among like-minded people here or here or yes. there. And that's how conspiracy theories really catch hold is when nobody actually says, oh, by the way, you know, we, we worry a lot about conspiracy theories in social media, but Hans Christian Andersen actually uh, talked about that one in The Emperor's New Clothes, right? It was a conspiracy of silence, not telling mm -hmm. the emperor the truth. And what we need is to have systems to tell the truth well to each other and to recognize that we all see through a glass dimly. And if we can find ways to um, care more about the truth, even if it means I might lose the argument. Yes. That's the to challenge. To be willing to be wrong. Yeah. yeah. To be willing to be wrong and yeah. to be willing to admit that we're wrong. I mean, that's hard enough around a family dinner table when we're talking about, you know, trivial matters. And yet it's hugely important. And I think we need leadership uh, in institutions to be willing to say, you know, I am wrong. I was wrong. I could be wrong. Um, you know, as we've been navigating COVID, uh, I've, you know, people tell me, how can you believe that? How can you do? And I think, well, we could be wrong. This is the best judgment we've reached thus far, but we could be wrong. And then they'll look at me like, really? And I'm thinking, well, of course, you know, we're and doing the best we can. And to be willing to forgive others for being wrong, right? Yeah, uh, to, yeah. yeah. 
I wish we had quite a lot more time, but we don't. So I want to thank you, Greg. And I want to thank our underwriters today, Howard Miller Company and the DeVries Institute for Global Faculty Development. Thanks for being with us today. Please join us again tomorrow and have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>